Arnold Schoenberg, the author of Grand Masters of Chess, once said, Chess, on its highest level, is as competitive as football, as thrilling as a duel to the death, as aesthetically satisfying as a work of art, and as intellectually demanding as any form of human activity. Nowadays, chess is a worldwide phenomenon, but it wasn't always like that. Bobby Fischer changed competitive chess for the better by making it more publicized around the globe, raising the average tournament prize money, and by doing so well at an early age. It was 1972, and the chess community was in a frenzy as Bobby Fischer was about to challenge the reigning chess champion, the Soviet Union's best player, Boris Spassky. Let's take a few steps back, approximately 29 years earlier. Bobby Fischer was born at the Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago to Regina Wender Fischer. Fischer's legal father was the biophysicist Hans Gerhard Fischer, but in a 2002 article of the Philadelphia Inquirer, it was revealed that Fischer's true father was most likely the mathematician and physicist Paul Nemini. At the age of six, Fischer's sister, Joan, taught him how to play chess, and by the age of seven, he was playing competitive chess at the Brooklyn Chess Club, where he was tutored by the club's president, Carmine Nigro. It was at the age of 13 that Fischer started to make an impact on the chess world. It was at this age that Fischer became the youngest ever youth chess champion. And that record still stands. Only as he got older, Fischer's paranoia, which was always present, started to increase. It started with small incidents where he would complain about the occasional noise, location, or lighting. He asked to put the camera away. He wanted me to clear the cameras out of the hall. Now, when you used to walk out of matches, what were the reasons for that? They used to well, talk about your all, terrible yeah, temper. Yeah, well, yeah. First of all, I only dropped out of two matches in my whole life. And uh, mm -hmm. I just looked it up the record. I, I played in about 60 matches my whole life, so it's been a little exaggerated. Mm -hmm. But I was complaining about the lights, the spectators were bothering me, a lot of noise. You know, they were using mm -hmm. All kind of horrible lighting, chandelier type lighting, when actually you need really soft lighting for it. It's a serious business, you know, five hours. Working Why, with your eyes, you know. Quite so. because of the glare or the, the, glare, the light shining into your yeah, eyes. Yeah, the light shining into your eyes. Mm -hmm. According to him, the cameras that filmed his games made audible noise, and harsh or bright lighting affected his ability to think. Things started to look better for Fisher after he devoted his attention to the World Chess Championship. He was set to play Boris Spassky, the reigning champion in Reykjavik, Iceland, in the year of 1972. Only things weren't going as planned. Fischer refused to play in the championship unless the prize money was doubled. And so it was. The prize money was doubled from $100,000 to a whopping $200,000, thanks to British investment banker Jim Slater which is about $1.8 million in today's money. This was an unprecedented amount of prize money for a chess match back then, and it still is. The championship lasted 21 rounds before Fischer came out on top. 20 out of the 21 games played were televised, and Fischer immediately became an American icon. He made headlines in the top American newspapers like the Los Angeles Times, New York Daily News, and the New York Times. After that iconic year, chess became significantly more popular, especially among younger players. FIDE, the International Chess Federation, put together a graph that displays the average age of rated chess players and the steady decline in the median age of, to of the top 100 chess players.
after the 1972 championship. He stopped playing competitive chess altogether until 1992 when Fisher played a chess match against his rival, Boris Spassky. But the match was set to be played in Yugoslavia and Yugoslavia was currently under UN sports sanctions due to the breakup of Yugoslavia. So after the match was played, Fisher couldn't return to the United States. The match had a prize pool of $5 million, an extraordinary amount of money for a chess match. It still stands today as the most expensive chess match ever. After he defeated Boris Spassky for a second time, Fisher went into exile. He was not allowed back into the United States, so he ended up hopping from country to country until he was arrested in Japan in the year 2004 because he had an invalid passport. Suddenly, Fisher wasn't America's hero. Instead, he was their problem. He was released from prison nine months later after the Icelandic parliament granted him citizenship. Fisher lived out his final few years in Reykjavik, Iceland, the city where his greatest victory occurred all those years back in 1972 when he emerged as the world chess champion. He lived a quiet life until he died of kidney failure in 2008. How did Bobby Fischer change the face of chess? Was the change positive or negative? Many chess players believe that Bobby Fischer left a stain on the chess community after he said many controversial things about many different people. Although after reviewing all his life accomplishments, it is clear that the change he set in motion was for the better. Why is this? Well, for one, Bobby Fischer did many good things for the chess community. He made a new chess club, raised awareness for top-level youth chess, and insisted on prize money increasing, which ended up affecting tournaments all around the globe. The only thing that he did that might negatively impact the chess community was saying some controversial things as his sanity declined. Women make bad chess players? Oh, they're terrible chess players. I mean, some are better than others, you know, but... Uh, why they may not so? play in men's tournaments. I don't know why. I guess they're just not so smart. <laughs> this is my reply to their order not to defend my title here. Karpov Kasparov match was prearranged, move by move. The dirty Jews, they're all saying, oh, Fisher didn't write the book he said he was going to write. Yeah, but they don't say that they stole all my file on it. There is an argument for both sides, but it is clear that after considering the facts, the good actions outweighed the bad. In addition, the Netflix TV series The Queen's Gambit is indirectly related to Bobby Fisher's life from his early years to his 1972 championship versus Boris Spassky. After The Queen's Gambit was released, chess boomed. The orders of chess sets increased 87% after the release of the series, and the sales of chess books went up 603%. It's clear that after Fisher's life, his legacy still affects the chess community positively. In conclusion, the modern chess world wouldn't be the same if Bobby Fischer hadn't been a chess player. Tournaments wouldn't have the Fischer bonus time increment. We wouldn't have had the Queen's Gambit TV series. And we wouldn't have 12-year-old grandmasters. That is how Bobby Fischer changed the face of competitive chess. That is Bobby Fischer's story.